of good classes, uh, and many of you come week after week. Uh, you know, Kimberly, welcome. I'll introduce you more formally. Uh, and I, I just remind people, you know, we do this as a sort of community event. Oh, uh, to uh, it would be good to make sure everybody's muted. Actually, I'll, I'll mute everybody in a moment. Um, um, and uh, yeah, we do this a community event. We did it originally when we just first over a year ago when we had a you know just about a year ago we started this uh really as a way of connecting as a community faculty students administrators and then in the fall semester we decided we would still continue to do it but we would we'd have a very focused theme and it's about exploring you know the nature of business in the post-covid world and so we, we every week well not every week we do about seven this semester we get seven or eight uh, guests. We did it about seven last semester. Uh, we we bring in guests uh, and uh, and we talk to them about their business and uh, what happened in the pandemic and and also you know depending on the, the guests where they they see their business the uh, business going. So so the way we do this just um, you know we'll, Kimberly and I will talk for about a um, about twenty minutes and then a, and then we're going to split into small groups and give you a chance to. To talk, I usually give the topic, which is actually coming back with questions for the speaker about the topic, you know, post-COVID world. But uh, I do know that certain people have got a reputation for not following instructions. But uh, but it is a community event, so uh, you know you can make sure you know have a have a good discussion, and then we we finish off. You know, we curate. Danielle usually helps me curate the questions so that uh, we kind of continue that uh, discussion. So I'm really pleased to have Kimberly. Here's our guest, Kimberly Morgan. Uh, uh, Kimberly is working with a, a she's a, the, the chief operating officer and the head of people uh, at a lend up, which is, and that's a company we're gonna talk quite a bit about. It doesn't actually operate a, uh, for the time being, though she's gonna talk about some ex the expansion of the company uh, in Maryland, but it's a, uh, it's a, a, a uh, if you look it up, a very interesting fintech company. It's one of the, you know, very one of the things that we're going to explore. Uh, heavily, heavily financed uh, by, you know, some of the the elites of Silicon Valley. But names that you'd be familiar with would be Google Ventures, PayPal Ventures, Tomvest Ventures, QED Investors. You might know about Caper Capital. Uh, a number of others uh, are uh, heavy investors. And it's really about the focus is on you know getting anyone on a I think mission statement is anyone getting anyone on a path to better financial health. So it's a uh, we can discuss whether you like this description uh, or not, uh, Kimberly. But uh, you know in some some circles we'd see it as an alternative to payday lending and uh, with with a heavy educational and a very different sort of focus on it and a focus on financial inclusion. So. Um, and but Kimberly has got a you know a, a really great a, a track record. A, her career has largely been in finance and administration. In fact, I think yeah, she started off in early in her career. We were talking earlier on. Uh, you know, you were always at Baltimore Life, but uh, early in your career, I also think you worked for UMB, uh, University of Maryland, uh, University of Maryland uh, in Baltimore, and. Um, um, but eventually you work through a number of jobs and one of the, I think the keynote that I think you, you brought out when we, did, we, we talked about it was that you see yourself as driving or operational excellence, that's what you, you do, but with a very particular focus, which is on the organization's asset, greatest asset, people. And, that's right. and so working in, to build high performing diverse teams uh using that really to increase communication connectedness with people and so you were appointed as the first african-american director of budget and operations at the at national academy of the sciences and and there you spearheaded the organization's first diversity initiative within the office of the chief financial officer uh, i think you pursued that a uh, in Pursued doctoral studies at Oklahoma State, where you're focusing on organizational behavior at the intersection of diversity and inclusion, while you were leading operations for Faith and Politics Institute in, in DC. Um, you 
uh, currently holds a, a Bachelor of Science in Accounting from North Carolina a and State University. And uh, as people, you know, Kimberly, when I introduce many of our, some of our guests don't make this a particular claim, but you do make this claim as being one of the smartest people in the universe because you have a master's in business administration from the University of Baltimore. So uh, that's, uh, so that's a, uh, so it's great, it's great to have you. So, so really welcome. You know, what I really interested, let's do two questions to combine at one time, you know, maybe a little bit more uh, in around a, what Land Up does and, 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 you know, maybe briefly where it's going, but, but, you know, it, you know, if you can intervene in that, interweave in that, how did you get this job? You know, you're not a chief operating officer and the uh, and, uh, people officer at a, you know, at a, a well-resourced, a, you know, Silicon Valley fintech company. So tell us a little bit of land up and then tell us a little bit how you got there, okay? All right. Okay, well, first, thank you for having me. Um, I'm so excited to be here with my UB family, yes, I am very proud of the MBA that I attained at the University of Baltimore um, while working at the University of Maryland Dental School. Um, you know, I Lend Up is an organization that um, speaks to everything that I've been passionate about personally uh, in terms of financial literacy for underserved communities. And so my passion, you know, throughout my career has always been in nonprofit and advocacy sectors. And so, but I was always very strong academically in numbers and financial management. So it was, you know, navigating throughout my career to try to merge the two and here they are. LendUp is an organization that was founded seven years ago to um, disrupt the, the traditional markets of creating opportunities and microfinance at, at a customer's disposal without going through a lot of red tape that other you know, partners or competitors might take them through. You know, for a customer to be underserved and in a financial bind at a place where they need cash to get them from A to B, but they, we don't want them to get into a financial trap like some other um, resources might, you know, provide them that service. So LendUp was founded to provide a quick tool for people to get access, but also our responsibility to them was to, you know, educate them along the way so that they could understand the impact of, you know, financial management wherever they were. And so there was a full suite of products that were, that are available to customers. Um, one is the traditional, you know, just individual loan that comes with, you know, you have to um, get it, you know, make a partnership with LendUp to say you want to improve financial management. And then there's the latter journey that customers can go on where throughout your, you know, relationship with LendUp, we will take you through financial educational modules to build your credit, to also help with financial management so that at some point you don't need to come to lend up for that bridge of microfinance. So we enter, we're at the intersection of social impact and advocacy at the intersection of you know, financial literacy and inclusion. Um, that's why I bring my nonprofit financial management advocacy background to the table for an organization or a corporate entity such as LendUp. So, and to how I got the job, I think my steps have been ordered to this to date for this role. You know, I kept um, marching along what was important to me um, and what I was good at. I was always good at financial management and financial management of organizations, I should say. I will say when I first came out of college, I was not, you know, that great in terms of financial management because I was focused on my career and moving up the ladder, if you will, in terms of the, my corporate ladder um, or career ladder. But sometimes, you know, the transitions I would get caught up in not focusing on personal life and personal financial management because you go from your parents' house, you know, some people to college and then you go from college, you go to career. And whatever you're focusing on, if you're not looking at all of the core tenants, one sacrifices the other. 
but I stayed true to what I was, you know, passionate about, which was financial literacy. I educated myself. I talked with groups. I became involved in, you know, certain organizations, um, used organizations, and that I was um, affiliated with to insert my advocacy. And then throughout my career, I just feel like, you know, the opportunities presented themselves. I feel like my time at, you know, Baltimore Life was paramount because it gave me um, the skills that I needed to understand how accounting systems work. That was actually one of my first jobs out of the dot-com boom, right? Where I had to bridge the gap between, you know, a new accounting implementation and understanding how the old versus the new would work together behind the scenes. And then I went on to, you know, get my master's at the University of Baltimore, seeking to understand strategy as it relates to business. And that's what I focused on. I was really um, engaged in the international focus. I, I think I mentioned that I took that as an angle as well and did the, um, the uh, I, I guess it's a, a practicum, if you will, where you do an international studies. So I wanted to be inclusive you know, all along my journey, I didn't get to travel a lot growing up because we had to split our time between Alabama and New Jersey. So um, global travel wasn't something that we did. My dad traveled globally, but I was always seeking, you know, an inclusive understanding about people. And I was also passionate about financial literacy. So throughout my journey, once I got to the National Academy of Sciences, we took an academic approach to everything that we did at the National Academy of Sciences, whether you were studying, you know, climate change or we were in the office of chief financial officer and we inserted, you know, financial literacy and advocacy um, and diversity and inclusion. That was one of my core initiatives um, to bring in interns to, you know, study certain aspects of the advocacy space. And then I went on to um, pursue my doctoral studies uh, for organizational behavior because I just became so immersed with, you know, people are the core tenant of how we all work. You know, we're all the same um, in some aspect where we have unique um, aspects of us that make us slightly different from one another, right? And understanding those behaviors, I felt like I would be able to accelerate how I manage people because management was very, very important to me. Um, at the intersection of understanding people's cultural backgrounds. I found, you know, I, I hit some walls at the National Academy of Sciences personally in terms of management, and I wanted to understand that a little bit deeper. So when I wanted to pursue my doctoral studies, the late great Congressman Lewis asked me to come and run his nonprofit, the Faith and Politics Institute that he founded almost 25 years ago. And I thought that it was probably going to be one of the easiest jobs that I had because I have, you know, managed this large, complex financial management system called the National Academy of Sciences with a billion dollar budget. And I said, oh, okay, I'll come and help you. And I get to, you know, work with you every day. It was probably one of the hardest jobs that I ever had because I had to deal with the smallest budget that I'd ever seen. And I had to make magic happen out of that small budget and also deliver on his programs. So it was an exercise of, you know, understanding financial management again at a different transition. Um, I worked with him for five years. We talked a lot about, you know, how I could serve, you know, in addition to the work that he was doing. And he said, you know, once you leave faith and politics, just follow your steps. Don't have a path. Just, you know, stay true to who you are and that job will come to you. And so once I left the national, I'm sorry, faith and politics institute after traveling with him to South Africa and Northern Ireland and, you know, three pilgrimages to or delegations to Alabama, one with our first African American president, President Obama at the Burj in Selma. Um, I decided to take a year and a half gap year to really take a step back and think about what the next steps would be because working with Congressman Lewis was a surreal experience. 
And what do you do next after that, right? Um, there's an ordered step where, you know, some go over and be lobbyists. I knew that wasn't what I wanted to do. Um, but what organization could benefit and match my, um, my personal, you know, and professional passion? So over a year and a half, I traveled globally. I learned about different cultures. I went to Italy. I went to um, Amsterdam. I traveled all over Europe. And I decided that I was gonna come back and start some small uh, consulting agreements to get myself back into the groove of working. And I knew once I started with consulting, there would be an organization that would be a good fit for me. And it was, I got the phone call in March, actually March 19th of 2019 to do a three month consulting agreement to scale the head of people um, or the to scale the people department. They wanted me to interview for the head of people role. And I said, no, I'm not moving to California. That's not happening um, because my base was still on the East Coast. And you know, within one week, I probably fell in love with the organization and the mission and the leadership, You know, all of it just aligned. And I still kind of pushed back on the thought of moving out to California. I still wanted to keep it contained to, you know, control my my future. But the stars had aligned at that point, and you know, it was a three month turned into six months. And then, oh by the way, you know, that six month never even matured. It was you're the new VP of People as of May 28th in 2019. Um, and then all of you know my other experience sort of started to play a role with, you know, financial management, you know, advocacy, the nonprofit space. Um, you know, I do have a background in customer service, which was early on in career, and just understanding the back end of how systems work. You know, the CEO said, I really need for you to take a more pivotal role as we expand. So I'd like for you to be the CEO. And I said, what? I was thinking about doing a year here and moving back to <laughs> the East Coast, but here I am. So that's how I got the job. You know, there was no real recipe. It was just following my steps. That sounds fat. I mean, there's there, there a number of things there in that career, but, you know, uh, Katia uh, was running a course a few weeks ago uh, with students and uh, we talked about, I remember we actually, some of the students who were on this call were there and we, we talked there about how you know, you should never underrate any experience. That's you know, right. You know, every experience can be used or be built on at some time. And, uh, and, and, and I think following your, your steps is, a, is an interesting metaphor as well. You know, so that, you know, it's a, that's, it's a wonderful story. I want to come back, you know, to land up, getting a, a little bit more about what you're doing about land up by, but, and before we break into groups, I want to focus on have you, you know, sort of describe what happened in the pandemic. I mean, a year ago, you know, we're, yep. you know, and, and then maybe just a little bit more than a year ago in, in California. I mean, but we've got pandemic happened, and you're certainly you're an online lender, but but um, you know, you know, how did it change your business, and and how did it change how you operated? So it changed significantly, you know, during the pandemic or the initial um, period of the pandemic, which we call, you know, the end of February to the end of May, I mean, end of March, because we all thought that we were going to return to normal at the beginning of April. That was our, you know, California and the Bay Area was, we were, we were on shelter in place until April 8th, and we were all thinking that we were going to, you know, move forward at that point. But, um, we saw an initial economic decline, you know, globally in the market because people were concerned about their finances and everybody was in a cash preservation mode. So, you know, the anyone, no one wanted to spend money on credit cards. No one wanted to spend money or borrow money, right? Because they didn't know what the economic outlook would look like for them personally. But we, you know, specifically Anu and I, the CEO, we thought about what does this look like for the, what does this look like globally for our customer base a year from now and three years from now? Because at some point, what, whenever the pandemic lifts, you know, the, the economic response will turn, right? And so we have to be able to pivot quickly. And so that's what we did. Um, we thought about, you know, where our customers were. We gave them, you know, a lot of relief in terms of hardship 
program relief to take that burden off of them if they were in the process of a payment coming due during the initial, you know, three or four months. And we continued to work with them in terms of providing financial education. But then we decided this is the time for us to pivot and build upon our financial health and deliver on our mission by creating a new platform, which is the digital banking platform. A lot of our customers are underbanked. Um, and so they, you know, need a full suite of products that the traditional banks aren't able to provide them. So that's what we did during 2020. We worked with our current customer base that are in the lending space to, you know, work with them in terms of hardship, but then also strategically pivot to, you know, develop another product that would be able to support them along their journey, you know, once the pandemic was relieved. And internally, you know, what, you know, you know, how did you, how, how did it affect your you know, how you work uh, as, a, as an organization. So, you know, because I, we created a foundation, um, right, going right into remote work, if you will, of celebrating cultural differences. So it was all about celebrating diversity at a really deep, meaningful impact level where people were getting to know each other. It was a brand new team um, that had turned over from 2019 to the first part of 2020. So they really had, the organization really was held together by that human connection. So it was seamless going into remote work environment. Where people started to hit the wall was the mental fatigue and exhaustion associated with, you know, constantly being on Zoom, not having the human interaction of the open workspace, um, you know, dealing with, you know, what's happening at home that they normally wouldn't have to deal with, you know, in an open forum in, in front of their, you know, colleagues. And so we normalized that, right? We normalized whatever was going on around them to, you know, continue to deliver for our customers and deliver on the work. And we also made mental health a priority. That was a core tenant very early on where I increased the benefits um, or and actually added benefits for employees to be able to take up to 10 mental health sessions uh, throughout the year that were paid by the company. In addition to a full suite of, you know, just no questions asked, Here's, here are days that we are gonna close the company because we know everybody's afraid to take time off, right? Because everyone was concerned about losing their job because people were doing layoffs. And we said, okay, why don't we just have days off where everyone feels comfortable that we're going to not operate? You can still work if you want to, but that means no one has responsible for responding to emails. No one has to respond to Slack. I don't know if anybody uses Slack. No one has to be on if they don't want to so that people had time to you know, reset if they needed to without the stress of the ongoing operation. So those were some of the initial things that we did. And I can't believe that that was over a year ago. It seems like it was just yesterday. Uh, now, I'm hoping that, you know, people, there, there are a couple of questions already in the chat, but I'm hoping that, you know, you know people are intrigued enough to have a discussion about uh, about this and, and, and the fintech. So I'm going to break people into sort of groups now, then we, we'll come back and you can ask questions. So you in the groups, uh, you're, you, you, you know, you know, discuss what kind of questions you want to ask Kimberly coming back, you know, either about land up and where it's going. Uh, and, uh, and I've got a whole ton of questions as well, but, uh, but I'm, I'm going to allow you to ask a, you know, ask for, ask first. Does that, does that make sense? So, so I'm gonna I'm gonna create these breakout groups now, and okay. um, um, I'm gonna uh, oops, Kimberly, you know, you know, welcome back. There, there was a question earlier on from a one of our finance professors is looking at the what is the major difference between lend up and traditional microfinance, and a, uh, but particularly, you know. How do you determine the, the way you in, you charge interest rates to the borrowers? And that's a, you know, so you know, give some like I think that would give them a, an opportunity to fully describe the business. Okay. Right. So you know, we do have a credit scoring model that's patented. 
Um, our, you know, former consultant had chief credit risk officer, he developed that model. And so based on that model for normally customers that have a credit score under 540, which is our customer base, um, but that normally wouldn't have access to getting microfinance loans, um, that model determines how customers' interest rate is calculated and their payment schedule as well. So I can't really talk about it because if I talk about it, I'll get in trouble because I won't explain it the way he explains it. But um, yes, we do have a patented scoring model that even the CEO, when she gets on Yahoo Finance, she's like, you're gonna have to talk to Ozer because he's the one that developed it. I'm right, uh, Kimberly, that, um, am I right that unlike payday lenders, uh, you know, if, if you lend me, you know, money, I pay it back, you, you also take that into consideration. So my next loan might be less interest or, you know, That's correct. Other, other terms, you know, That's so correct. it's, uh, you, so it, it, you, it's a sort of dynamic model, is that? That's right. And it depends right. on where people, when people come to us, there are customers that come to us that have, you know, a credit score between, you know, 540 and 600. And, you know, they might be eligible for a different type of loan before they start with, you know, one of the other products. And so mm -hmm. that will start them on the latter journey of building, you know, credit building along with financial education models that are re required to, in addition to paying off the loan, completing one of the financial education modules and, that's the full, you know, suite that we need to get you to the next level in terms of credit building. But yeah, it depends on, you know, the credit score, um, income, of course, but, you know, we don't take customers through a lot of the red tape that the traditional um, mm -hmm. entities do. And I think you just answered two questions there as well, too. They're on the, the chat, you know, so it, it's a, the algorithm or the, the method is, the, is, is patented, you know, so, so that, 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 and, and also it's required to take financial education to, you know, if, if you get it, take a loan. That is correct. Yes. It's part of, we have um, three strategic partnerships with, you know, the financial health network, Emerge, SoFi, um, and one other that, you know, we use their financial education tools to help create digestible mod modules for our customers, you know, to make sure that they're culturally sensitive um, and, you know, our customers are able to complete them without, you know, being overburdened with a lot of financial jargon that, you know, might not be something that they want to participate in or actually understand. We need for, we wanna meet customers where they are in terms of their financial health and education journey. And that doesn't mean that it's a full, any one tool will be able to service all of our customers. So we take those strategic partnership relationships and then turn that data into modules that is digestible for our customer base. But yes, it is part of the requirement to go on a journey with us. There's a great question from um, from Heather here. I'm gonna just part of it. I'm gonna, gonna focus on about about the pandemic. Whether it had an impact on on people's access, you know, because and I think this is a question I was, you know, I, I, I was I was looking to to ask you anyway about with this population you're looking for whether you. You know there are challenges with digital inclusion, and uh, and 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 Heather is pointing out in the pandemic that's even even more serious because you know in the publicly available Wi-Fi like in libraries was was people were locked out of that for some time. Yeah. So how you know so did in the pandemic did you see changes in 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 access, but also maybe you can expand about you know whether digital inclusions uh, is an issue for your, your type of business. So we do have a population and a segment where they want to talk with someone, right? They want to have a relationship with LendUp on a personal level. And so the customer service department that um, you know I'm responsible for, they have a small 
you know, special accounts handling team that's responsible for providing customers with that special touch customer service. They will go through anything with them from walking them through the application with them because they can't do it online or through the app. They will go through financial health education tips. If they saw something online that they have a question about, whether it's related to our platform or someone else's platform, and it relates to an instrument that you know we have provided them and they have a question about, the customer service department is there to answer those questions to bridge that gap. So we do provide that human touch. We don't have bots, we don't have chat windows, even though a lot of you know the, the digital companies are moving into that space. Um, I do feel like that's one of our biggest um, ways that we separate ourselves from others in the market is that we still maintain our in-house customer service department that we can that we have oversight on in terms of how we manage the relationship with the customers. Um, a lot of companies they outsource and then you kind of lose the control in terms of what you can and how you interact with your customers. So we have that in-house. And, and a question that, that came out from our group is, um, you know, it, it's what type of community partnerships do you have in place? Community partnerships, how long do we have? That was the first thing that I, <laughs> I walked through the door. So the, um, the former head of strategic partnerships who recommended me for the contract for this role, um, she's really big in the advocacy space. So we had, you know, partnerships with everyone from the Aspen Institute Financial Network to, you know, local community initiatives in Oakland and the San Francisco Bay Area, because I, we firmly believe because we were brought up in the same, you know, if you will, network in Washington, D.C. and in the Baltimore um, DMV, where you have to make sure that, you know, the, the community is served at the same time that you're um, customers are served because your your community essentially are your customers, whether or not they're your customers or not, right? And so at some point, someone in your community, which is why Oakland has been paramount to making sure that we serve the local communities. One is the Bay Area Educational Foundation um, that we just signed a, a partnership with, and we're going to kick that off for Financial Literacy Month, which is next month, April. Um, so we do have probably about 40 or 50 strategic partnerships to make sure that we're investing in communities and organizations that, you know, ultimately have an indirect or a direct impact on our customer base. Um, and, and Damon asked a particular question here about uh, whether you charge fees to individuals for, the, for a service. I mean, is that the service for the, the financial literacy service or the... We do not. We do not. So we 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 enter into the we do pay for um, the relationship with our strategic partners for the financial literacy module. So Spring Four, SoFi, um, Emerge. We we go into a, a partnership with them that comes with a fee, but we do not directly charge our customers for that at all. Mm -hmm. And. Uh... And the, yeah, uh, uh, another question just came up about what do you think of business schools like ours, like MSB could be doing to help bridge the financial literacy gap? You know, do you, you know, um, is, there, is there something in business schools, you know, I think Ting is asking, should business schools be a partner here, here <laughs> for, as well? Actually, that's, that's on our roadmap is to partner with, business schools, I just had a conversation with the University of California system, you know, it was a big part of my network coming out of the National Academy of Sciences. So I do believe that the conversation needs to start, you know, in business schools and in colleges, but also in other non-traditional areas for, you know, people that are not going to college, right? So we are looking to expand our reach in terms of making sure that the financial literacy conversation 
is something that's not taboo. And that's what I'm working on with, you know, Lend Up and Ahead and our investors. When people hear financial literacy, it almost makes them feel like it's a remedial, you know, um, edu exercise, but it's not. And so I want us to change the conversation about just financial health and what does that mean, right? Financial, mental, physical health, they should all be part of your core tenants to navigate through life. And educating yourself about your finances should be one. Um, but we wanna, we wanna make sure that it's digestible for everyone that we serve. And yes, we, we do need to incorporate the University of Maryland, specifically the University of Baltimore Business School into that conversation. Yes, and I do like the you know I, I do like that concept of financial health as opposed to financial literacy. I mean, right. you, 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 which actually you know comes to you mentioned earlier on in, during the pandemic that you were uh, building uh, decided you would build out a, a new digital banking platform. Uh, and is that the ahead financial? Is that the ahead financials that you just recently announced? It is. Uh, it is. Yeah. So you, uh, so you might want to give you a chance to do a little marketing uh, for in Maryland because LendUp is not available yet in Maryland, but it's, uh, yeah. but a, but more but but I had financial though. So that's getting into a slightly different segment. Is that is, is that right? That's right. So the digital banking platform, anybody can it's anybody can sign up for um, Ahead Financials. It will be a digital banking platform. Um, that can be in conjunction with your traditional bank. Um, and we want to make sure that our customer base that is underbanked has an opportunity to get a banking account without um, going through, you know, the review process that a traditional bank might take you through. But then we also want to make sure that, you know, an additional customer base that is on a journey of financial health to have an additional banking account that is accessible digitally um, and doesn't have as many um, bells and whistles as a traditional bank, but some different bells and whistles to help with financial management and financial health. And you know, when I said we were going to launch into this space, I said we were going to make this cool, we're going to make this culturally sensitive, and we're going to make it so that everybody, regardless of where you are, wants to understand financial health and management through the digital banking app. And if they need to, you know, have a product from Lend Up Loans, that's cool too. But with AHEAD, it is, you know, all rooted at culture, community, and inclusion. So we led with a cultural um, campaign and marketing campaign to really bridge the gap between art, enter entertainment, and um, sports and education so that we had conversations in those areas because all of those are important and they drive culture in this country and globally. And so I wanted to break that down a, a, another layer and start having conversations about what they're passionate about, which is art, education, um, sports and entertainment and build in the financial you know, conversation into that, right? So that we're not focusing on here, sit down and take a class on financial literacy. We are talking about, you know, cool topics that drive culture in this country, but we're also talking about something that's really important too, which is financial health. So we started, we kicked that off with Twitch, a Twitch stream in, in December and everybody thought I was crazy, but my CEO was like, if you, whatever you touch seems to work out. So you go for it. You never done marketing before, but like I told you, Dean, um, then when I took his class, I didn't know if I was gonna be a marketing person at one point, but I probably wrote one of my best papers in his class. And now I hear he's the, the Dean of the school, but yes. Um, I wanna department make it- Department head, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Department head, yeah. yeah, yeah. Here we go. That's a no. That's cool, and I can see. Um, and certainly, we've got a lot of data in Baltimore on the unbanked, you know, or the low banks, or never. I think that um, there, um, there are definitely definitely marketplaces there. So I'm going to ask you the last, you know, last question, and I'm going to pass over to one of my colleagues to have the second last say. Uh, okay. And a, but I'm a. So, uh, you know, 
you know, you, you're going to want to, you, you know, with your experience and your journey, but also with this kind of industry, this kind of business, um, you know, thinking about our students and, uh, but thinking also about our faculty or teaching them, you know, you know, what should they be coming out with and, uh, you know, that, that you're really going to value so that you'll, you'll, you'll go out and hire them. I would say have an entrepreneurial spirit when you leave business school. I think that's probably the biggest thing that was rooted in me, but I didn't know it was, is my ability to think creatively. Um, and as an entrepreneur, even if I was inside of an organization, you know, there will always be someone that will listen to your ideas, whether you're in corporate America, you know, a nonprofit or what have you, and continue to think creatively in an entrepreneurial spirit as if, you know, you own the company or are a leader of the company because, you know, it will guide you to, you know, achieving your goals, you know. Sometimes I used to be a little close-minded um, with the accounting and the, the raw talent associated with just being structured in terms of numbers. But once I broke open and started learning accounting systems and then studying organizational behaviors, I started thinking more as if a leader and creatively how to solve problems at a macro level. And I think that's what you know started my creative juices in terms of how to, you know, achieve my passion project. So I would say thinking creatively, thinking with an entrepreneurial spirit, because you know there are a lot of disruptors um, in the market right now, in every market, and we need more, right? And it's only if you think creatively and in an entrepreneurial way that we'll, we'll start to move that needle and see things shift in terms of disrupted markets. Well, thank you. And uh, we've, had, we've got some additional questions, but I, but I think we've got to, we try and bring this to, to a close. I'll, uh, you know, I'll, you know, I'll ping you. Uh, uh, David asked a very good question about high school students. I'll ping that to you so that you can get back to him and connect you again with him. And uh, okay. uh, awesome. yeah, and uh, I think one of our professors is going to change the you know, uh, we, we have FIN 300 on our books, which hasn't been taught for a few years, which is titled Financial Literacy. So maybe we'll entitle that Marlin Financial Health. But, uh, so, um, but uh, you know, usually we, we have someday, one of our, one of my Dean Suite or one of our board usually, uh, you know, rather me thank, thanks. And she says the, the word of thanks. So Marlin uh, O'Black, who taught you, as you reminded, yes. is, is, yes. is going to, so he's going to say a few words, you know, just to thank you. And then I, I've got one announcement to make and then we'll be finished. Okay. All um, right. Marlon. So Kimberly, on behalf of the students, faculty, staff, and the Dean, we, and all of our friends who are here with us today, we would like to thank you so much for joining us today and telling us about your journey. And I can't just help but think that your message and your journey of social inclusion, um, community engagement, financial health, I'm gonna use the right word, and I'm gonna say entrepreneurial spirit. I was actually writing that down, as you said, as an important takeaway from business school, because I think you exemplify all of those so well and we like to think that in the Merrick School of Business, we try to exemplify those very values. I mean, we have a long tradition in accounting and finance. We have tried to establish ourselves as an institution that cares very much about community engagement and inclusion. And so for you to share your journey and entrepreneurial spirit with us today, I think you can tell, I know my group was just chattering away and had more questions than we could get <laughs> to ask. And I know from the other groups in the chat, similarly, you just inspired us all to think more about so many things in terms of what we can do to improve our communities through the work we do based on each of our own individual career journeys. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. 
We're going thank digital you. clap. Oh, thank you. It's, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. This has been wonderful. No, yeah, and you know, and it's wonderful having alumni come back and be part of our family. So, uh, so, so, thank you. And announcement: we do have a session next week uh, at the same time. Uh, okay. Our uh, our guest is a is actually another MBA graduate. It, it's a Sunil Budrani. And he Sunil is the the CEO of Innovation Health, which is an integrated health provider in Northern Virginia. He's a He's actually a, a he's actually a physician MBA. He's a he did his a, uh, he did his a, um, MBA uh, after qualifying as a physician. He's a and he also is still a well is still a CEO of a of a large health system which is now owned by CVS incidentally. Uh, he is a, also a practicing emergency room surgeon three nights a week at a George Washington University, so a uh, hospital. So uh, he, he's, I think he'll be an interesting perspective on uh, on the pandemic and what's happening in in, uh, in health. So that'll be that'll be four o'clock next week. And so uh, look forward to seeing you. And thank you again, Kimberly, and uh, everybody. You know, be safe, okay? And uh, uh, so thank right. you. Thank okay. you so much. Right. Take care, Kimberly. Thanks for Bye. coming. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye, uh, Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you. It was so nice to meet you. So nice.